Welcome to Baltic World. My name is Charlene. And I'm Crispin. And no, this video isn't clickbait. For the first time on YouTube, we will showcase a major event leading up to the Second World War that forces a fundamental rethink of the events leading up to the 20th century's greatest tragedy. And don't worry, we bring receipts. World War II is thought to be settled history. From Hitler's rise to power through to the Nuremberg trials held after the war, this is one of the most well-documented periods in world history. It's been accepted that the annexation of Austria on the 12th of March 1938 marked the beginning of Hitler's territorial expansion in lead up to war, climaxing with the invasion of Poland in September 1939. But what if we were to tell you that more than 10 years before Nuremberg and several years before the annexation of Austria, there was another mass trial of Nazis under international auspice? One which proved, beyond any doubt, Hitler's expansionist ambition and the underhanded false flag methods used to achieve it. An event which until recently was suppressed and lost to history. Today, the city of Klaipeda is situated in northwest Lithuania on the Baltic Sea. The city, known in German as Mamel, was lost by Germany in the Treaty of Versailles and brought under the League of Nations administration, particularly the French. Ultimately, it was acquired by the newly independent Lithuania, formalized in the Convention of Colonus of 1924, which granted Lithuania's access to a warm water port along the Baltic coast. However, many residents of Klaipeda held strong pro-German sympathies, and in March 1933, just two months after becoming Chancellor of Germany, Hitler received a delegation of local Nazi activists from Klaipeda. At that meeting, Hitler promised he would return Mamel to Germany, appointing his secretary, Rudolf Hess, to coordinate all Nazi activities in the region. Two Nazi organizations, the Union of Christian Socialist Workers of the Mamel Region, CSA, and Socialist People's Union of the Mamel Region, SOVOG, subsequently carried out pro-German sedition in Klaipeda, receiving instructions and material support by Germany's consulate in the city. The Lithuanian government, alarmed at the perceived threat of a Nazi uprising staged by foreign power, passed the State Protection Act, which among other things made collaborating with a foreign government against the interests of Lithuania a crime, and commenced a vigorous law enforcement investigation, successfully penetrating both organisations. The Lithuanian State Security Department, VSD, infiltrated these Nazi organizations in Klaipeda with their own agents. Surveillance activities initially proved difficult because many group members were from legal professions and law enforcement and thus familiar with how covert operations worked. A key breakthrough came when Jorgis Jusicis, an active German party member in Klaipeda, turned informant and revealed how CSA, Sovog, and the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazi Party, were connected. Specifically, the Klaipeda Nazi members were directly subordinate to German leadership and did not work independently without their instruction. On 23rd of March 1934, Jusicis disappeared and was later found murdered. Meanwhile, another man, Adam Molinus, was a Sofolk office clerk and became the primary insider witness against the Klaipeda Nazi party after his arrest. His testimony brought special state protection. Molino shared intricate details of the murders perpetrated by the Nazis with state authorities, including the killing of Jorgos Jusicis for turning informant. He also revealed the mechanisms by which members and leaders were connected to the German consulate in Klaipeda. Initially receiving a sentence of four years in prison, he was released early. However, his testimony attracted condemnation from Nazi party members and Molinos was labelled a spy for Lithuania. He was instructed to travel to Königsberg by German agents for questioning. Fearing for his life, he sought and received asylum in Lithuania, where he continued to cooperate with state authorities. When Germany occupied Lithuania in 1941, however, Molinos was found by the Gestapo and executed. Other former members who were suspected of cooperating with Lithuanian law enforcement also received threatening letters along the lines of, quote, With great sorrow, we have to inform you that you've become traitors to the homeland. You did it in a moment of weakness, but we will make your part easier. Until we meet again.
significant Nazi figures operating in Lithuania were arrested throughout the year. And then on 30 September 1934, 142 indictments were issued of whom 126 were successfully arrested and brought to trial in the then Lithuanian capital of Kolnus, thus beginning what we henceforth will call the Kolnus Trials, the largest mass trial of Nazis prior to Nuremberg. The indictment ran to 508 pages and would later take three days at trial just to read out. As Lithuania was officially at war during this time, the colonist trials were through military tribunal. The indictment summary begins as follows, quote, In 1924, a secret organization was established in the Klaipeda region with the aim of wresting the Klaipeda region from Lithuania through an armed uprising. Even on the night of August 4 to 5 of the same year, an armed uprising was planned, and the organization in question contacted foreign state organizations to obtain support for the plan's implementation. Although the uprising did not succeed, the intention to seize the Klaipeda region from Lithuania was not abandoned. The primary allegation in the indictment, however, was that with the direct support and direction of the Nazi central government in Berlin, the accused sought to orchestrate an uprising that would see the Klaipeda region annexed into Germany. It laid out a series of examples showcasing Hitler's ongoing intervention in the region, including supporting German schools, sponsoring the city's theatre productions, and funding anti-Lithuanian press and propaganda. It also drew extensively from public statements made by German leaders and quoted directly from Hitler's own writings in Mein Kampf. The German government immediately requested that the trial be conducted in secret so that Germany would not be implicated and also for only light sentences for the accused. Both requests were refused and journalists from across the world were invited to witness the trial so that Nazi crimes could be brought into the light. Press from at least 20 foreign countries attended from across Europe and as far away as Argentina and the United States. The Colonist trials would prove the largest legal proceeding that Lithuania would ever have in its history involving over 650 people, including 15 experts, 296 witnesses for the prosecution, and over 200 for the defense. The most notable defendants were the Nazi leaders, Lutheran pastor Theodor von Haas, who was the leader of the Union Christian Socialist Workers, CSA, and Ernst Neumann, leader of the Socialist People's Union of the Mel region, Sobog. Initially, German Nazi Secretary Rudolf Hess and Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels were both to give testimony for the defence, but this was later withdrawn. The trial began on the 14th of December 1934 and was housed in the Lithuanian Parliament in Kolnus. Throughout the trial, damning evidence was presented about Nazi sedition activity in Klaipeda. At one secret SOFOG meeting, that party's propaganda chief, Dr. Edriat, tried to prove that, quote, that the Lithuanians were the greatest enemies of the Klaipeda region and that the old inhabitants of the region who worked for Lithuania were traitors to the country, and that this is why they fight not only for themselves and their children, but as authorized representatives of Adolf Hitler for his territorial policy for the East. End quote. Lithuanian police had also successfully raided an illegal Nazi training exercise where local militiamen were learning to build trenches and fortifications with a view to securing the city once an uprising had taken place. Another police raid had located a cache of 182 illegal firearms, of which more than 150 were military rifles. This was in addition to another 922 firearms that were previously registered to Sovog and CSA members by lawful permits. The defendants were represented by 11 highly accomplished Lithuanian legal experts who, while being loyal Lithuanians themselves, vigorously attacked the prosecution's case to the delight of the German leadership, which, despite being bitterly critical of the trial throughout, raised no objections based on the procedure or how the trial was conducted. The trial ran until late March 1935, interrupted by winter recess, with the verdicts being announced on 26th of March and handed down formally on the 3rd of April. The court found a connection between the German Nazi parties operating in Klaipeda and the German National Socialist Workers' Party led by Adolf Hitler, 
and that the Kleiperter Nazis, inspired by Germany, were planning a rebellion, although their plans remained unrealized, and that the Kleiperter Nazi leaders were directly guided by Adolf Hitler's deputy, Rudolf Hess. The evidence presented was so overwhelming that even the Nazi propagandist regime did not deny these facts. Penalties were severe. Four received capital sentences for the murder of Yogos Yusuchis, two more life imprisonment for attempted murder of another perceived Lithuanian spy, Wilhelm Loops. Sovog leader Ernst Neumann was sentenced to 12 years imprisonment together with his deputy, Willy Bertoli, while CSA leader Pastor Freya von Sass and 14 other defendants were given eight years with the remainder of the accused being given between one and six year sentences, along with 37 acquitted. The verdicts were reacted to with anger in Germany, with 34 protest rallies occurring across German cities. In Berlin, more than 100,000 demonstrated in the Lost Garten with chants, down with Lithuania. Hitler himself rejected all contracts from Lithuania due to the events of the trial, and during discussions with the British Foreign Secretary, Sir John Simon, Hitler indicated a willingness to enter non-aggression treaty with all surrounding states except Lithuania. Lithuania's Foreign Minister, Stasis Lotaraitis, hit back saying their government was not fighting German ethnicity, but combating subversive activities through legal means. Likewise, Lithuanian Prime Minister, Tubelis, emphasized the British Ambassador, Preston, quote, Lithuania only wants to conclude the trial and then attempt to establish a friendly relationship with Germany." End quote. Still, Hitler's rhetoric intensified and German intervention in Klaipeda was not ruled out. In any event, Germany enacted economic embargoes and undertook a propaganda campaign against Lithuania's government, pressure which the Lithuanian government initially resisted. German backlash against Kleipeda's Jewish population also intensified during this period. Most of the support Lithuania's government received locally from within the Kleipeda region came from the city's large Jewish population, who viewed Smetona's religious tolerance in stark contrast to the Nazi party's anti-Semitic discrimination. Kleipeda's Jews fed critical intelligence to Lithuania's government throughout the 1930s, and were instrumental early on in exposing Nazi plans for a Kleipeda uprising. None of this was forgotten by Hitler when Germany occupied all of Lithuania later in 1941. Meanwhile, far from decrying the outrageous sovereignty violations and seditious violence organized by the Nazis against another nation state, Lithuania found itself increasingly isolated with major European countries, suggesting that Lithuania cede to Germany's demands. Faced with such international cowardice and with the Nazi threat looming, the Lithuanian government sought ways to de-escalate with Berlin while also preserving its reputation among the Lithuanian people. At first, the Lithuanian government, through the British, proposed a prisoner swap with Berlin, though this was refused by Germany. Ultimately, Lithuania's president Smetona progressively commuted the sentences of the accused and ultimately granted release, even to those convicted of murder. The impeachment the European community imposed on defiant Lithuania would do nothing to assuage Hitler's thirst for expansion. Emboldened by this weakness, in March of 1939, Hitler demanded formal annexation of Klaipeda into Germany, with a threat of outright war. Once again, the European powers, including Britain, France and Italy, urged capitulation. Lithuania's courage shone an early bright light on the threat that Hitler and the Nazis posed to all of Europe. It exposed the sponsoring of sedition, acts of violence and false flag operations that would become the hallmark of Hitler's expansionist aggression. It did so in open defiance of the Third Reich, transparently and before the whole world. It's clear that Lithuania's defiance had a major impact in Berlin. Evidence proves that prior to the arrest, the German government considered Kleipeda to be the lowest of all low-hanging fruit for its expansionist ambition. A city in close proximity to Königsberg, with a sympathetic local majority lying within a newly independent country widely perceived as weak. And yet, Lithuania's open and resolute defiance of this bullying anti-Semitic regime left the Nazi leadership dismayed, no doubt deterring further acts of aggression for a time until the West policy of appeasement later encouraged it, with Kleipeda itself being forcibly annexed by Germany in March 1939, 
to a muted international response. Despite the significance of the Kalnas trials and the story of the 20th century's greatest tragedy, they have largely been lost and ignored by history. Today, over 80% of Lithuanians report never having heard of them. The obvious question, why? First, the practical. Despite being widely reported on by contemporaries, the vast majority of case files were in Lithuanian, inaccessible to most later scholars. When the Soviet Union annexed Lithuania in 1940, many of the country's legal minds were seized and forcibly deported to Siberia as members of the elite. Then, when Germany occupied Lithuania in 1941, it seized most of the trial files, taking them out of the country to Konigsberg. Many of the people and documents which catalogued the trials were destroyed in the war. It was only 50 years later, after Lithuania's liberation from the Soviet occupation, that the painstaking detective work by Lithuanian-speaking historians could even begin. Then, there were the state interests involved, which for markedly different reasons were largely the same for every party. The Nazi regime's motive for suppressing is obvious. While the Western powers weren't keen on being reminded how their early prostration before Hitler had encouraged the Third Reich years before Munich. The Soviets weren't going to draw attention to Lithuanian's resistance to the Nazis, especially when their occupation was largely based on the myth of a Lithuanian-German alliance. Finally, once the Germans occupied Lithuania in 1941, Lithuanians weren't exactly eager to serve up reminders of their early antagonism. Consequently, the whole episode was largely written out of the story, commonly known today. The Kaunas trials force a fundamental rethink of our understanding of the events leading up to the Second World War. First, it further discredits the idea that Western countries could not appreciate ahead of time the extent of Hitler's expansionist ambitions until it was too late. After all, the evidence was laid bare for the world to see four full years before Germany's forced annexation of Klaipeda and the subsequent invasion of Poland that same year. Second, it demonstrably proves that there were those, such as Lithuania, willing to stand up to Nazi Germany despite enormous risk and would have continued to do so had it not been for weak-kneed Allied appeasement. Third, it informs our understanding as to the character of Lithuania's compliance with Nazi Germany during its wartime occupation, as it was clear the two countries were antagonistic leading up to it. And finally, given German surprise at the willingness of Lithuania to defy the Nazis and expose their crimes, a strong case can be made that, had the European powers simply stood by Lithuania during this time, Hitler's aggression might have been checked early and World War II might never have occurred. Instead, the willingness of Europe's major powers to side with the aggressor out of naked weakness, despite evidence of guilt so overwhelming that even the Nazis didn't dispute it, made subsequent war inevitable. Now, close to a century later, those same lessons appear instructive today. We would like to acknowledge and thank the intrepid scholars whose diligent and pioneering work has brought these events to light. Links to their publications, which so massively inform this video, are included in the description below. If you have found this story as interesting as we have, please share this video widely so that the long shadow of history that has obscured the Kalanis trials is rightly removed. We would also encourage any policymakers watching this video to consider how further research into the Kalanis trials and other creative initiatives to popularize it could be of benefit given Lithuania's early role in standing up to fascist tyranny.